Inside the heart of the future Liberty State, brought to you once again by On Fire Ministries and the legacy of Dr. Stan Monteith, bringing you the story behind the story, the news behind the news. It's not about right or left. It's actually about right and wrong. Better hope not being a man, but in Jesus Christ, about not ending in prayer, but moving to action. And it's also about the gospel of the kingdom. But before I get to the gospel of the kingdom, I just want to talk about a couple of things. First of all, in the time that we're in, we need to be united in the spirit. And that's not unity for the sake of unity. It's unity in the spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit is leading us. Now, a lot of people will give that lip service, but what does it actually mean to be led by the Holy Spirit? It means that we're praying every day, we're in the Word every day, and when God tells us to be immediately obedient, we're immediately obedient. We also have a quickening of time, and it says that God will hasten the time in, I think it's in Isaiah, when there's a hastening of time, there's also less time for grace. It's not that God's grace has been diminished, but there's less time for grace for you to not be immediately obedient to the Lord. So if God calls you to do something and you don't do it, there's less time for grace to be active because the time is being hastened, the time is being quickened. And so we come into this time right now where it seems like we're living a decade. Travis, I mean, we've talked about this. It seems like we're living a decade every week, and it's hard to keep up with everything. And so in the midst of all of that, it's great to know everything that's happening in the world and happening locally and all these kind of things. But look at the bigger picture. Step back and see the forest and ask God, what, what am what am I supposed to be doing right now? How do you see my situation? What do you want me to be doing, Lord? And when you do that, then everything else comes into balance. Everything. We have many people who want to try to make their own thing happen uh, without the leading of the Spirit, and then you, you can kind of see striving and that kind of thing, and you got to be really careful with that, because God says if we're flowing in Him, that's not going to happen, and especially in times of crises, like I believe are coming here in, in the United States. I mean, I just believe there's going to be crises, uh, and we're going to go kind of from crisis to crisis even faster than it is right now, and I know people are like, whoa! But don't get caught up in the fact that we're going to be in crisis. Get, get focused on where God has you in this time. Because this is the gospel of the kingdom. This is why it's the gospel of the kingdom. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. So then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built, so this that's the unity part previous to that, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Okay, so prophetic word is a release from heaven of what is written in heaven about each one of us. The destinies not only of people, but of nations that being released. Now, apostles are the builders. They're the organizers. They're bringing together. So that's a foundation for the time that we're in right now. So we face a crisis. We get the word from the Lord. It's confirmed in people's hearts by the Holy Spirit, by that unction, that conviction, that impression. And then there's apostolic leadership. In other words, there are, there are people that are helping to organize and build according to what the Lord is calling us all to do. And we have to, we have to figure out where, where are we fitting in all this? Where does God want us in all of this is the body. And then it says, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. In other words, everything is founded on Jesus. He is our theology. He is the word. The word is a person. The truth is a person in Jesus Christ. We want to focus on that. And if he's the cornerstone, we want to be in, it, kind of the picture there is connection, direct connection, constantly in connection with him. Getting his strength, his trueness, because a cornerstone gave the trueness of direction for the building, and, and getting his heart. Now, it's interesting that the other scripture that talks about this actually talks about seven eyes being in the stone. This is in the Old Testament. And it, it's, it's talking about the spirit being released through that cornerstone. It's a beautiful picture. 
in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, and that's us, in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling or habitation of God in the Spirit. And the picture there of the temple in Jerusalem is that we're filled on the inside. We have the Holy Spirit coming down upon us on the outside as well, which empowers us. So, so one is relational, the other is empowerment. We're getting God's heart, we're getting his mind, and the other is empowerment. What does God want to release here on the earth? Uh, you can see this in the Old Testament, actually, where the uh, Holy Spirit came upon uh, the elders that Moses had appointed, 70. Two of them, Eldad and Medad, aren't even in the camp. and Or actually, they are in the camp because the other guys are outside. And the Holy Spirit still came on them, and they began to speak in tongues and prophesy. Okay, And specifically, it talks about uh, another thing that happened that is similar to the New Testament. I'll get to that here in a second. But... Moses specifically says, when it says that they prophesied, and I'll get to speaking in tongues. I'm going to keep those two things separate because it was just, they, they prophesied. That Joshua came to Moses and said, hey, these guys are prophesying on the year of the prophet. They shouldn't be prophesying. He said, would everybody prophesy? And it was, it was actually a prophecy about what would happen when the Holy Spirit fell. So he didn't say speak in tongues and prophesy. I'm, that's the overall theme here, which I'm going to get to in a second. The other is the giving of the law. Um, the old uh, uh, rabbinical sources taught that a fire came down when the law was given and it circled the camp. So this is similar to what happened in the upper room where the fire came down, circled everybody, lighted on them, and they began to speak in tongues and prophesy. In the time that we're in, God's heart, his mind being inside us, then being released into the world, is what is going to transform everything around us. It's going to transform the atmosphere. It's going to transform everything. And, you know, Jesus came to a point where he looked at the disciples and he said, some of these things are hard. Some of what's on my heart is hard, that you need to eat my body and drink my blood. That's hard for some people. And people started leaving. And then he looked at his disciples and he said, you guys are going to leave too. Because there comes a point in each one of our walks when, when the external factors or even what, what God puts on our heart is, is hard. And he says, hey, you're going to leave me too. Or, or are we actually going to press into that? Press into what he has, even if it's hard. And watch the world change. Because those that stayed with him, God changed the world through him. And that's my message really for you today. That if you stay with him, if, if even what he puts on your heart is hard. And even other people are, are it's hard for them. And, and so they, 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 they just can't go there in their walk with Jesus. If you stay there, God will change the world through you. And that brings us now to your daily intelligence briefing. On the international front, okay, once again, I'm telling you this stuff, so it's going to motivate you to press into the Lord, but you got to know what's going on out there and, and from a biblical perspective. And one of these is a very interesting um, situation from a biblical perspective. Okay, so I, I'm going to go just right up front to this prisoner swap. Um, Russia and the United States, Brittany Griner for this arms dealer. Well, Paul Whelan, or Whelan, remains locked in a Russian prison. I, We should do whatever we can, even if an American citizen hates America. We should pour out enough grace, because they're Americans, to try to get them home. And I'm sure Paul, as a, a former Marine, is thinking, yeah, I'll take the hit for somebody else. Because he's already made that choice to sacrifice for his fellow countrymen. So I'm sure Paul... 
probably his family too. I know I, I saw something earlier. You know, they're, they're fine with the prisoner swap. But why has his release not been more of a talked about thing? I would hope the, the Biden administration is trying to get him out. Because, of course, he's going to say, yeah, take her. Because I'm going to sacrifice. I can take it here in a Russian prison. You take her and bring her home. I mean, he's an honorable man. I'm sure that's what he's feeling. But it doesn't mean we leave any American languishing anywhere around the world. And you've heard me talk about this. Um, the horrendous thing that, that uh, President, then General Eisenhower did under uh, FDR and Truman, leaving 22,000 Americans British in uh, New Zealand, I guess or maybe Australia, New Zealand, Anzac troops in prison camps in Russia uh, under Stalin to, to essentially die there. And by the way, my great uncle was one of those people. He ended up escaping Stalag 4B um, and then escaped a Russian prison camp again, make it, made it back to U.S. lines barely, made it back to the United States to tell the tale. So uh, prisoners, there's, there's actually several books on this. Uh, Prisoners of Misfortune, probably um, the one, also The Forsaken is another on these, this kind of issue. But my point is we don't leave an American behind, period, end of story. We don't leave an American behind. All right, also on the international front, and this is probably the bigger thing in regards to the Russian-Ukrainian thing. Okay, it, We talked about last show briefly about this, that there was this weird visit by Shoigu to Belarus, uh, Belarusian leader stays up till midnight, and there's a, an updating of their defense pact. Well, now this is coming to us from open source intelligence, Belarus uh, military personnel belonging to the Western military district are currently engaged in combat coordination and counterterrorism exercises. These troops have moved significantly closer to the Ukrainian border. The state news says there are ongoing threats from Ukraine to Belarus, even though that's not true. The Ukrainians are objectively, you see it on satellite photos, open source, they're fortifying their border, but there is a marsh, and actually it's kind of famous. If any of you play Axis and Allies, the marsh is actually depicted on the map, okay? So everybody's going to go run and look at this. But the point is there's a marsh there in southern Belarus, northern Ukraine border area. So there's only a few routes in. So Ukrainians, of course, are like, hey, we don't want you guys to invade again. We're going to mine and we're going to fortify that border. Well, they're calling that an, a, an aggressive action when, I mean, candidly, we should be fortifying our border here in the United States. So, okay. Then it says, Baylor, uh, Belarus and Russia signed these amendments to their 1997 uh, security agreements, and that these are the most significant exercises yet, and are most certainly being exercised by Russia. Here's the bottom line. It looks like Belarus may actually fully come into the war. Now, they're being used for logistics, supply, um, transportation, for the Russian military, but it looks like Belarus may be fully coming into the war. If that happens, there will be a response by NATO. And so this could be one of those catalyze, catalyzing moments that brings a broader war uh, into Europe. So again, this is objective. Just looking at this, these, this weird visit, and now these exercises that are getting closer to the Ukrainian border. And we're going to keep continue to Keep watching this. Also, uh, coming to us from Indo-Pak News, shifting over to China, um, the United States Army wants to deploy Typhoon launchers to fire standard SM-6 or Tomahawk missiles with a 500 to 1,800 kilometer range. Um, and they want to do that in the Pacific. So they're not saying Taiwan, but it's kind of implied here. Japan, South Korea, for sure, Philippines, they want to put these uh, anti-ship missiles, but also these are dual launchers. They can also be anti-ship and they can be anti-aircraft. All right. So that just says to us, continued buildup in the Pacific. All right. And 
I want to shift now to the two most significant things that I think are here. I want to spend a little bit of time on this. Um, the first is we're going to go to the national front. Um, very, very interesting video. Um, Brandon House had an attorney on, and uh, Travis, you can make sure this gets linked on here, had an attorney on that talked about a, a f essentially a COVID concentration camp being built in California by a railroad. Now, we've cataloged this before, and the, the legacy media tries to make this into a conspiracy theory. This can't be true, et cetera, et cetera. Even though they were building facilities to house people, just like China, by the way, who are quarantined for COVID. Now, I'm going to go a step further and give you some background here because I've heard this garbage for years when it's, it's very clear that there is, there is a concerted effort around the United States to identify shelters and camps for emergencies that could be used for anything. And that's why people are concerned. So people say, well, this doesn't exist. Actually, it does. If you pull that up, Travis, this is, it's called the National Shelter System or the National Shelter Database. FEMA put this together, um, and it is a list of designated emergency relocation centers and shelters. And this is their termino terminology, camps and mass shelters that is in conjunction with the National Disaster Housing Strategy. So for people to say there are no such thing as FEMA shelters or mass shelters or camps, well, it's a lie because FEMA literally has built this whole database and identified these places. Now, here's where the, the, dif the difference is. You, you don't have like FEMA owning it. They've just identified these possible places. So, for example, fairgrounds are... At, uh, uh, very commonly identified emergency camp that people could be brought to where there is a massive natural disaster. Now, here in Spokane County, that happens to be right next to a railroad and right next to a stadium that could be used for an in-processing center. That in and of itself is not nefarious. But the fact that it could be used for nefarious purposes is why people are concerned about this. What can somebody mandate that people need to go there just like they're doing in China? What mechanisms are in place to prevent that? Like, oh, I don't know, the Constitution. So this isn't far-fetched for people to ask questions about these things because they are real. And I put this up on Twitter. You can go check out this stuff for yourself. There's a fact sheet on the uh, national shelter system, for example, in addition to general population centers, the system includes medical shelters, shelter in place locations, points of distribution, war warehouses, embarkation and debarkation and reception processing sites, which is typically revolving around railroads. And any type of facility or shelter related to the management of people affected in an operation. So, I mean, it, it, everybody's open about this. OK, so, so FEMA shelters and camps, as it were, do exist as far as being designated in the National Shelter Database. Okay, so our question should always be, what can that be used for? What mechanisms are in place so that can't be abused or violate our constitutionally protected rights? All right, next thing, and this is huge. Okay, so I'm going to give you my own analysis on this um, based on several sources. So... This is weird. So Moore County, North Carolina is right near Fort Bragg, and there is a high concentration of special forces there. There was an attack on two power substations. Um, and in fact, if we could bring up, I don't know if we've got a, well, if you don't have the map on it, that's fine. But they're, they're basically, they were geographically separated in the county. And they were essentially what are called final points of failure, which means that there wasn't really any way to route around them because they were so rural. So there's a couple things about this that I want to point out to everybody here. And, uh, and then I'm going to read a couple quotes from 
local things here. First of all, high voltage transformers, HVTs. Now, when Trump came into office, he began a high voltage transformer stockpile program in case our grid was hit either by cyber attack or by EMP so that we could have grid resiliency and those things could be replaced pretty quickly. The problem with high voltage transformers are they are made specifically for that substation and they're made overseas, uh, Korea, Germany, and, and the lead time on making a transformer is months. So if you lose a transformer, it's not like you can just go down to the store and buy a new one. It has to be made. And in 2013, a very similar attack happened. And I'm going to go this, through the specifics here of what happened in Moore County, North Carolina. A very similar attack happened. It's called the Metcalf sniper attack. And what, what the best they could figure is that a unit, a squad, went to pre recon firing positions. In other words, they had done reconnaissance, surveillance, identified firing positions, went to these pre recon firing positions sent somebody down a manhole, cut some wires that were the monitoring wires, except for one, between the substation and the main control grid, okay, station. I'm trying to keep the terms kind of simple here. Then they, I'm not going to say what they shot at, but they shot at something which, which caused the high voltage transformer to begin to overheat. Now, when that came to the control station, they saw it, they shut the high voltage transformer down, it did some damage, and then they rerouted power around that substation. Okay, here's the problem. In Moore County, North Carolina, it's final point of failure, they, they can't necessarily reroute. And so what they're doing now are essentially blackouts and kind of power on, power off as they're trying to fix this substation. It doesn't sound like the substations were actually shut down. Now, I'm going to go back to 2013 for one more second. Or series of seconds. In 2013, Dr. Peter Vincent Pry talked to us on this show several years later. That in 2013, at the same time as the Metcalf sniper attack, a south-orbiting North Korean satellite was right over Washington, D.C. So, in other words, he believed it was timed exactly to be a probing attack to see what our reaction would be. Many people believe that in these North Korean satellites, there may be maybe a nuclear bomb in that that would be gravity dropped on the United States. South-orbiting means it comes from the south and it misses our early warning detection systems, although that has changed, but when they launched it, it was that way. It missed our early warning detection systems, and so we would have less time as the United States to react to something coming down from one of these satellites. Okay, now, going back to Moore County and this area, a couple of these things that are unprecedented. Okay, first of all, essentially martial law light. They went to a curfew. Now they have begun to shut down I think it was like tattoo parlors and some other stuff. Totally unprecedented for a power outage. People are like, what's going on? But then it gets even more interesting. The, and this is why I, I, I'm bringing this up now. It looks like there was mechanical breaching. There's evidence of mechanical breaching. In other words, tools being used to break into the, the substation and attack it. In addition, so this is similar to what happened at the Metcalf sniper attack. Furthermore, back in the 1960s and 70s, and let me back up for a second. So, first of all, the narrative that came out in the, the legacy media was that this must be right-wingers or something like that, right? That proved to be unfounded, but this you probably don't know, and this is very little known, but because you listen to Patriot Radio, you get the stuff nobody else does. In the 1960s and 1970s, the Soviet Union actually had a plan to take down the power grid in America through crude methods and decentralized cells to hasten the collapse of America. Now, Yuri Bezmenov, we, we talked about him on the show before. He talked about the Soviet plan to gradually take America to a, a crisis point and a collapse. Part of that plan was this. Now, 
communist cells to this day have this as part of their plan in America to hasten its collapse. This is why the Russians are attacking the Ukrainian power grid because it's always been a part of their doctrine. So these, what, what is more concerning though than, than more county and the lockdowns and everything, and that, that really to me indicates a national, international attack on America's power grid is this. Federal law enforcement sent out a bulletin that warned of power substation attacks in Washington and Oregon. Power companies in the Pacific Northwest are reporting physical attacks on substations involving people using hand tools, so mechanical breach, and arson to destroy some of the infrastructure. Now, they didn't talk about shooting, but I'm getting a couple reports that maybe there was shooting at one. We don't know that for sure. But if you can bring up, Travis, the, the first graphic there, Washington Hydropower supplies power to nine other states. And so Washington is a target, the Pacific Northwest in general, but Washington in particular is a target of these grid plans of the communists. Because if they could take down part of the grid in Washington, it would affect all these other states. In fact, uh, Dr. Pry, actually, um, we brought this up. I think we brought this up last time he was on the show. You bring up the next graphic. There's actually a grid failure map that talks about if you knock out enough substations, there would be catastrophic grid failure. And the Pacific Northwest is one of the two main catastrophic failure areas in the country. So this tells me that we are experiencing what could be a national, international level actor. So nationally coordinated, maybe communist cells in America or an international actor sending its own units in to take down the power grid here in America, and they're trying to cover it with a narrative that this is right-wing conspiracy theorists. Here's the point. As soon as Biden took office, in 72 hours, he removed Trump's hardening of the grid. A lot of people missed this. We reported it here on Patriot Radio. And so now we're set up for catastrophic grid failure if enough power stations, substations, are attacked and go down. So two lessons out of this. Number one, be prepared And number two, don't buy into the mainstream media narrative. This legacy media narrative, this very clearly looks like an attack that is coordinated intentionally along the same plans and lines as the communists to take down the American power grid. And in at the very least, even for, for folks that are on the other side of the aisle, this is, should be a very real possibility that we should be discussing, especially after China said the United States essentially would pay a price for the protests that were happening in China. So a week later, suddenly we've got these attacks and people are saying, well, it can't be the Chinese. But it makes sense it would be if the United States, if they're accusing the United States of fomenting these protests and spending all this money in the protests to destabilize China, that they wouldn't try to retaliate against the United States of America because clearly this looks like not a probing, but an actual retaliation. So with that, be prepared. Now, moving to the local front, Pastor Andre Shapoval is going to be here from Flame of Fire Ministries this weekend, Sunday, 10 o'clock here at On Fire Ministries in downtown Spokane, Look forward to all of you showing up. Um, Pastor Andre uh, just does a fantastic uh, job. And more importantly, he is an anointed man of God that brings the fire of the Lord to wherever he goes. And I don't know about you, but we want to be on fire here at On Fire Ministries. And that's the briefing. Remember the antidote to dependency of socialism is to be a God-fearing, self-reliant, freedom-loving American. Thank you to everybody that's supporting us. And make sure you go to Gab, MeWe, Getter, um, at Matt Shea, at Matt Shea one on Truth Social. And just like the page and share the page. It's the best, it's the best thing that you can possibly do.
Okay, Danielle. And so, I wish you guys would wait for me. So today, it is my pleasure to introduce Alex Newman, senior editor of the New American Magazine, and also one of the great investigative journalists of our time. Alex, it's always great to have you on Patriot Radio. Thanks for joining us again. Great to be here. Thank you so much for having me, Matt. Yeah, so I want to just talk quickly. I know you've got several things that we want to get to, but um, I want to talk quickly about your take on this attack on the power grid in Moore County, uh, North Carolina. I mean, the response seems clearly out of proportion for a, uh, you know, for a power outage. What's your take? What are you hearing about it? Well, I was actually listening to you a little bit before coming on, and I think uh, you're exactly right to sound the alarm and urge people to be prepared. Uh, sabotaging of critical infrastructure uh, has always been a, a key tool of revolutionaries, of Marxists, of things like this. Um, we know that they've done it many times in the past, um, and we know that they plan to do it again. Uh, interestingly, uh, I just got back from Egypt at the UN Climate Clown Show, and um, their <laughs> whole agenda basically was let's take down the energy grid. <laughs> right? You guys can't be using all this cheap and abundant and plentiful energy that God provided. Uh, you got to use windmills and solar powers that won't power anything. So um, I, I think it's important for people to uh, to recognize that this agenda to leave us without power. Uh, is very real. It's very serious. It you know it could be the Antifa clown down the street. It could be Klaus Schwab when he talks about uh, we might have a cyber pandemic where you won't have electricity and makes a COVID pandemic look like nothing. Um, so I mean, you know it, it, you, people do need to be aware. People do need to be prepared. And a sabotage of critical infrastructure like power uh, is a very very real threat. Well, Alex, you're you're getting uh, pretty good at uh, uh, the Klaus uh, Schwab. Uh, Imitation. That's pretty good. I, I really appreciate that. Actually. You can do that. Maybe, maybe I could be a stunt double. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you want to be a stunt. <laughs> what happens to Klaus Schwab's <laughs> stunt double? <laughs> I don't even right, want to so, know. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah, that's a whole separate show. Anyway, so sabotage of the power grid. So, so there's two kind of takes here. We, we just talked about kind of the, the hard sabotage of somebody going in and actually trying to destroy uh, substations, et cetera, and the power grid. But then you have the subtle sabotage, which is what you're talking about right now, which is the green energy agenda. It is a subtle sabotage of the power grid. Now, I'm going to back this up right now. Back in uh, 2017, I believe, I, I specifically spoke about this in the legislature, that we were going to be at grid instability by 2030 if we continued down the road we were with policies. Specifically, bringing online all of these so-called green energy options which destabilize the power grid because we don't have baseload power. So let's go into what they talked about um, and what you know, kind of the trajectory of where you think this is going to go here in the next, uh, you know, six months to a year. Uh, and are there more meetings that are going to come up where they're going to try to implement uh, Agenda 2030 or the Global Reset? Yeah, it's coming fast and furious now, Matt. Uh, the two key policy objectives that they had at this UN COP27 that I was at in uh, in the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt, uh, the first objective was to set up a permanent and massive wealth redistribution mechanism under the guise of having us pay climate reparations. Um, you know, they, they never quite put a number on it, but the World Economic Forum they featured a guy who said maybe four to six trillion dollars per year might be appropriate to spend on this. Um, you know, others were throwing out hundreds of billions, just absolutely insane numbers. Uh, so that was one of the big objectives. And they were able to get that into the final agreement. Every government on the planet agreed, including the regime in Washington, D.C., the uh, European vassal states of the European Soviet, uh, the Australians, everybody else. They all agreed. Uh, we owe climate reparations to the people of uh, not really to the people, really to the kleptocrats misruling them. Uh, because we industrialized, because we, uh, we've we had power for the last hundred years, things like that. So that was the, the big policy. The other big one that they were pushing was uh, they wanted to get into the agreement uh, a clear and specific call for the phase out of fossil fuels, which is yes, mm -hmm. uh, gasoline, uh, diesel, oil, um, uh, get natural gas, uh, coal, all these different uh, forms of energy that God has uh, blessed humanity with. And uh, they didn't get that in the final text of the agreement. And that's partly because, uh, you know, there's a few governments that uh, depend pretty heavily on uh, oil exports and things like that. They weren't willing to 
to go along with that. And these things were done by consensus. But um, huge, huge progress on the permanent wealth redistribution, huge progress on moving forward Agenda 2030. In fact, right now they're meeting in Canada for the COP15 on the biodiversity agreement. But Matt, I think the most important story to come out of the COP27, and this is what I'm focusing on in my uh, upcoming major reports for the New American Magazine, uh, is the religious story. Uh, and I think mm. you'll appreciate this more than most. Uh, you may have heard that they came up with a new Ten Commandments. Uh, yes. True story. You've got a new Ten Commandments. Uh, so you've got this now global fusion of religions, this global religious movement. Uh, that says basically we all agree on the same virtues and morality and things. We need a new moral system. Uh, and uh, they actually. Uh, Alex, can I stop uh, you there real quick? Can I stop you there? Can, yeah, go ahead. Travis, can you bring up a golden calf real quick? Okay, go ahead. Continue. <laughs> I'm glad you're bringing up a golden calf because, you know, th these clowns actually pur purporting to represent all these religions, uh, they walked up Mount Sinai. Um, wh what they say is Mount Sinai, the, the mountain that's called Mount Sinai on the Sinai Peninsula. Actually, I went there yeah. the next day and they took these Ten Commandments, these green Ten Commandments. And um, one of the ringleaders of this whole thing, they call him a solar entrepreneur. I refer to him as a green energy grifter. But he takes these ten, com these green Ten Commandments and smashes them. Uh, and, you know, he's pretending to be Moses. And he says, we are not happy with the progress on these climate discussions, things like this. Uh, and I mean, the irony is just off the charts, right? Uh, Moses, of course, smashed the tablets because he came down and the Israelites were worshiping a golden calf. Uh, I, I just I felt that in the spirit, massive. actually. Wow. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's so perfect because uh, it, it, it's almost the exact opposite, right? This guy here is, is pretending like there's compatibility between uh, paganism, between Islam, and uh, the the truths that were revealed by God to Moses and God's people on Mount Sinai. And you know, God was incredibly upset by this uh, worshiping of this golden calf, by these people trying to fuse the true religion, the truth that God was revealing with the, the paganism, the ancient religions of ancient Egypt. And yet that's exactly what these religious leaders were doing on the top of Mount Sinai. And then having the chutzpah, the nerve, the, the bravado to smash these tablets it's just, you don't even know what to say. And that was just the beginning of it, Matt. There was over 40 religious events that happened at this thing, and um, they are openly now saying that we need a new moral and ethical system. Okay, so let's let's break this down a little bit. So th this is why I wanted you to go, because people were like, oh, it's COP27, COP27. And then you're not talking about COP15 and all the follow-on meetings that don't get the same amount of publicity. So real quick, what is COP27? What is COP15? Just real quick for the listeners. I'm, I'm glad you asked, Matt, because uh, the, the UN, I think, deliberately tries to make this undecipherable. They use all these acronyms that normal people can't understand. I've been going to these silly meetings for uh, 12 or 13 years now, and I still don't understand all the UN speak. But uh, the COP27 is the 27th Conference of the Parties. Uh, the parties here are the governments that have signed up for this UN climate process for the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And so every year uh, they meet to save the world again. Uh, always at some beautiful exotic right. resort destination. This year we we're flying on the, in on the jets, the Red yeah. Sea and Charmilla. Yeah. Of course, private jets galore. Yeah. We're eating steaks and caviar. They're staying. We we went to some of these hotels where our leaders were staying. Nancy Pelosi and John Kerry. I actually ran into John Kerry. Remind me to tell you about that. Um, oh, yeah. and, and we're talking five, six, seven thousand dollars a night. Uh, I mean, they're feasting on the most scrumptious food you can imagine. They're flying in on fleets of private jets. And then they have the nerve to tell some poor little African trying to cook his dinner that you can't have fossil fuel energy. You need to use a windmill. Uh, I mean, it, it's so grotesque. It makes you want to puke, Matt. Well, first of all, I thought we were defunding cops. So apparently we're I, I don't know if we can go in that direction or whatever. Right now, we we support the police. But they do this to confuse people. People hear the word cop and, oh, okay, whatever. It, it, this is psychological warfare in, in many respects. Anyway, I, I don't want to get there on this show today. But I want to I want to dive right, into what you, they want. Yeah. They want people. They want people confused. They, they want to make this inaccessible. They want people to look at this and say, well, I don't want to sound stupid by asking, you know, what is the cop? What, what is the U.N. framework convention? They want people to feel like you can't ask questions. You can't access it. You just have to trust the experts. Okay, so I, we're going to get to what the, the new Ten Commandments are, um, but I want to ask you, so, so Alex Newman and John Kerry walk into a hotel. It's not a joke. This is real. <laughs> what happens? 
It, it, was, it was really funny. I ran into uh, John Kerry. He had a whole squad of goons around him. Uh, you know, if I had to estimate off the top of my head, I'd say he'd had, he had eight people walking around him, kind of like in a circle around him, and he was in the middle. Uh, and they're all wearing these face diapers over their face. I mean, this looked so ridiculous. I felt so bad for the poor goon squad that had to participate in this. And uh, Mr. Kerry! Uh, you know, Donald Trump had just announced that he was running for president. So, Mr. Kerry, uh, you know, Donald Trump has called uh, climate change a hoax. And, of course, he got us out of the Paris Agreement. He's running again. Uh, does this impact uh, the U.S. position on the climate negotiations in any way? And he says, Ooh. well, what's that supposed to mean? Ooh. So his goon squad had to translate for me. And uh, apparently and we've got this on video. Apparently he was saying that uh, we're just focused on what we're doing here. Um True story. And then I asked him about the, you know, because all I had talked to some of these third world governments, you know, I talked to the, the deputy prime minister of the Congo and, you know, all these uh, climate dignitaries that are out there demanding more uh, climate reparations and stuff. Uh, so then I asked John Kerry, uh, you know, how about this um, uh, loss and damage is what they call it, because, uh, you know, Western CO2 emissions caused all these losses and damage. Apparently, Chinese CO2 emissions don't hurt the planet. Who knows? But um uh, Western CO2 emissions did all this loss and damage. And so now we need to pay for it. And so I asked John Kerry to, hey, you know, all, all these governments are demanding all this uh, loss and damage funding from the United States. Uh, are you going to be willing to commit uh, the American people, the American taxpayer to pay for this? And again, Ooh, right, you can't understand the guy through his face diaper. But uh, one of his uh, translators explained to me that he said, uh, we're still learning uh, more about this. Is, uh, was his response. And so eventually he did end up committing us to that. Again, there's no specific number on it. They're going to have new meetings between now and the COP28, which will be in Dubai, uh, where they're going to figure out exactly how much money, who's going to get it, when it's got to be transferred, and all that kind of stuff. So if my wife turns up the heat at night and I'm sweating profusely and don't sleep really well, do I get climate reparations for that? <laughs> You should. You should. Well, Absolutely. I, right. I, I'm not a victim. I just I'm just asking for the sake of continuity here of logic. But anyway, I you know what? What does this mean? <laughs> I mean, all right, let's step back for a second. What does this mean for all of us? A new and by the way, so there, you're acknowledging there was a previous Ten Commandments that we should be following, which I find just ironic in, in many ways. They actually witness to the Ten Commandments of God. So they know the existence of the Ten Commandments of God, or else they wouldn't have gone up on the fake Mount Sinai and broke them, uh, these new ones. So, but what what do these new Ten Commandments say? What, what are they trying to obligate us to in this new moral and ethical code, if it's moral? Yeah, it, it, you, it, it's, it's immoral. But you know, even before the COP27 started, the UN Development Program put out a major report uh, that was intended to kind of guide the COP27 negotiations. And I actually want to quote from it real quick because uh, it's very significant to understanding what was happening there. Uh, let me see if I can get the uh, quote. So here it is. So uh, this was uh, put out right before the COP27. The report was called Uncertain Times, Unsettled Lives, Shaping Our Future in a Transforming World. Uh, and in there, they said, and I'm, I'm quoting directly from the text of this report, evolutionary processes and ethical reasoning may have interacted in reaching the current prevailing configurations of behaviors and institutions. But... Those configurations may not be a good match anymore, right? Um, the ethics and the morality that evolved with mankind over the last few thousand years is no longer adequate. And so then they just go and they, they come out and say it openly. They say uncertainty could be a source of knowledge to be mobilized to act differently, something that empowers individuals and societies to adopt fundamental changes in choices that leads people to act according to new moral codes. Mm -hmm. So they're openly calling for a new moral code. So the, the Ten Commandments that these people came up with, originally they framed it as a new Ten Commandments. They didn't say mm. new and improved, but uh, I'm sure that was their intention. And yeah. so here's what they put out, and I'll tell you what they clarified later, believe can, it or not. Can we put like these new oh ones God, in classrooms? Can we put these new ones in classrooms? Well, almost certainly. Not only can yeah. we put them in classrooms, we've got to drill them into the heads of these children so that they realize how sinful they've been with their carbon emissions and their eating hamburgers and things like that. I want to just stop real quick. I, I just This is a message to all enterprising uh, patriot lawyers out there right now. If they do put these in a classroom, I think that gives us standing to put the original and the actual Ten Commandments back in the classroom. Side note, go ahead, Alex. 
Yeah, I appreciate it, man. And I, I believe it was uh, 1980 when the uh, clown car, formerly known as the Supreme Court, ordered that we remove the uh, Ten Commandments from our classrooms, which uh, what an abomination that was. But uh, yep. here's the new Ten Commandments. They actually issued several different versions of them. But um, the first commandment was, we are stewards of this world. Uh, they said we recognize a human responsibility to love nature. Creation is not our possession, all right? So quit thinking you have private property rights over your ranch or whatever. Creation is not your possession, they say, okay? Uh, they say creation manifests divinity. Uh, and I mean, this sounds like just straight up pantheism. Creation is not simply external to God. It is in significant ways permeated by God's presence and being. We must treat all life with reverence. Uh, they say everything in life is interconnected. Wow. We must care for the planet. Do no harm. We are responsible for the well-being of all life today. Isn't that interesting? We're God. We, we have to be responsible for all life on the planet, says uh, the New Ten Commandments. Uh, they say that you need to use your thought, speech, and action only for good. Uh, you got to change your inner climate. Uh, a true story. Uh, it says the person is benefited by ongoing effort to purify, raise, and transform himself in a... Oh, that sounds sexist. I, they probably mm. didn't have a gender consultant here. Somebody better go back and revise these. <laughs> um, true True story. So uh, they say, oh, man, this stuff in here is just bonkers, Matt. Uh, use mind, open heart. Uh, they say um, you have to feel the pain of the earth. Okay, are you feeling the pain of the earth now? Uh, so so these are the new Ten Commandments. Uh, it's totally preposterous. And um, I, believe it or not, Matt, I, and again, I feel like this is why God sent me over there to expose this lunacy. Um, mm -hmm. I'm walking around in the UN summit, and I run into these guys, the, the four ringleaders of this thing. I just run into them. They're hanging out, looking for media coverage. Like, hey, I'm Alex Newman with the New American Magazine. Would you guys be interested in an interview? I'm like, oh yeah, absolutely. Let's go get a, a private room. We'll go over to this uh, you know government booth over here. We'll do as long as you need. So I get 40 minutes with the ringleaders of this thing, and wow. um, one of the four ringleaders, his name is uh, James Sterling. We've got the video. It's posted on our, our Rumble channel for people who want to watch it. Uh, James Sterling, he's the CEO of the Peace Department. He tells us, yeah, we got some bad press for, you know, saying we were coming up with a new Ten Commandments. So uh, this is actually, it should be considered an addendum to the Ten Commandments. Uh, we're still working out the details of the new Third Covenant, uh, but we are planning to build the real kingdom of heaven here on earth. I mean, almost word for word what this guy is this, told This me. is on video? And uh, obviously, this is on video. One of the can, we, can we clip this? this thing. We're, we're, I'm, Travis, um, we, we, we got to clip this. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I, I will send you guys the uh, the video. I don't know if Travis will have time to get to it, um, but I will send this over to him. And if he has a chance to clip it, that would be hilarious and people could watch it. If not, you can always air it on your next show. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, truly incredible what these people were saying. Uh, they gave me a copy of their Eco Bible. Uh, they have this Eco Bible now. Uh, they call it the uh, Ecological Commentary on the uh, the first five books of the Bible, uh, the, the Pentateuch. And, um, you know, I, I asked the guy who wrote this ecological commentary. His name is uh, Rabbi Jonathan Narrell. He's the head of the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development, one of the main groups behind this. And um, he says to me, he, he goes to Genesis and he says, you know, God put um, human being in the garden to serve it and conserve it. And, you know, like, note to self, that sounds off. And I went back and I looked at every single major English translation that I could find on the Internet. Not one single translation of God's word says that we should be serving the garden, right? We should be glorifying God. We should be tilling the garden. We should be tending to the garden. We should not be serving the garden. We should be serving God. But uh, this is where these people are going with this. Make no other gods, right? And yet that's where they start. I mean, they literally start with the exact opposite of the first and second commandments of the 10 commandments. And they, they know this. I mean, they obviously know this. this is a satanically driven agenda, but you know, many people believed that, well, you know, okay, I can go with you, Alex on one world government. You do a great job, you know, 40 foot stone, Alex, I, I can go there with you. Okay. I can go there with you on one world economic system, digital currency. Alex, you're right about that. 20 years ago now it's happening. Okay. I can go there with, but one world religion, Alex, really? And now this seems like their push. Now they think they have the other two, I think locked up. This is their push for some kind of one world religion that everybody can uh, agree to. Now, you know, recently the Pope did no favors by, 
uh, you know, signing a document with the Grand Mufti of Al Azhar University. So you have the chief Sunni jurisprudence guy, then you have the Pope signing this kind of new uh, era of religion that we all can agree on, and it re- and this is just in the last two months. Uh, it, do you see this? Are they going to continue these discussions? Do you see this going forward? And, you know, are people really buying into this? I mean, were there Christians there that were like, eh, that doesn't seem right? Or was everybody kind of like, okay, yeah, this is the next thing. And this guy is totally on board, uh, you know, with us talking about, uh, you know, an addendum to the Ten Commandments or whatever they want to do and a new Bible. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I, I did not meet any real Christians except a young Egyptian man running a computer business there and uh, the TNA team. Um, but uh, they are pushing very hard now for this one world religion. Now, I, I think the UN, the, the kind of godless, materialist, Marxist, um, you know, at least the useful idiots. Marx, of course, was a Satanist, but many of his useful idiots are, are actually godless. They're, they're atheistic. They have faith that there is no God. Um, I think they see this as like, uh, some of the terms they use is like, we're going to leverage faith communities. We're going to mobilize religious leaders to jump on board this climate bandwagon. But uh, they do have a lot of religious leaders, so-called. <laughs> jumping on this bandwagon. Uh, I'll give you an example. Yeah, The UN is actually funding and working with very closely an organization called Religions for Peace. Uh, they had a major meeting in 2019 that I covered for the New American Magazine. It's funded by George Soros. It's funded by the Rockefellers. It's funded by the UN. It's even funded by the State Department, which I guess separation of church and state is only Christianity and state, not false religion, globalist yeah. religion, Satanism. That's all fine. Uh, But when they got together, they came up with this final declaration and they said, uh, you know, we all have basically the same values. And so we're going to create an alliance of virtue and we're going to focus on our shared values and virtues. Uh, They also said we're going to rally our religious communities around UN Agenda 2030 as the model for human development. And so I think what's happening in the minds of the godless, and, and I think there really is a satanic, diabolical, occult element here. And I know we're running out of time. I'll get to that in a minute. But I think what's really happening here in the minds of the godless is what Peter Drucker, the management guru, described uh, as the three-legged stool, right? This is the guy who trained Rick Warren, Purpose Driven Life, right? Uh, This is the guy who trained a whole lot of these business tycoons and political leaders. Uh, He came up with this idea of a three-legged stool to bring about major changes. The first leg was the public sector, the government sector. So the UN brings together all the national governments of the world. The second leg was the private sector. And so Klaus Schwab, of course, is with, through the World Economic Forum, uh, signed a strategic partnership with the UN to bring the business community on board with Agenda 2030 and the UN climate agenda. And then the third leg of the school, well, Peter Drucker said, was the social sector or the religions of the world. And that is what they're doing now. They're bringing in the third leg of the stool so that they can fundamentally transform every aspect of life on this planet, Matt. Okay, real quick, the occult part of it. Um, we got about two minutes left. So that and if you can uh, tell listeners where they can go to read more about what you're talking about. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. So I have a major cover story article on exactly this subject coming out in the New American Magazine. It'll be in the first print issue of 2023. And I did some digging into the finances of all these organizations that were pushing this religious stuff at the UN summit. And what I found consistently is uh, big foundations with a background in the occult and the new age, the Fetzer Institute, which uh, was based on the teachings of Alice Bailey, the founder of the Lucifer Publishing Company. All right, they're also deeply involved in social emotional learning. You've got the Henry Luce Foundation, founded by Skull and Bones member. His nickname was Bail. Of course, he was big on the CIA's uh, Operation Mockingbird. So a lot more on all of this will be available at the New American Magazine. And people need to know this comes from the pit of hell. It comes from the pit of hell, and they even acknowledge that they broke. <laughs> I still can't get over this. Is, this is just blowing my mind. They broke the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, which was actually the symbol of the fact that those that were at the bottom of the mountain were worshiping false gods. And here they are breaking it and then advocating for false gods. Just incredible to me. Alex Newman, I, I so much appreciate you. Thank you for all you're doing. We look forward to promoting that. We're going to actually play that video clip probably next uh, show and love to have you on again soon because I just have this feeling things are kind of speeding up right now. So love to have you on the next couple weeks and kind of do an update right before Christmas. God bless you. And thank you again. Keep up the fight. Thank you, brother. God bless you too. 
All right. And uh, Travis, let's make sure we get, get those up there as well. Alex Newman, senior editor of the New American Magazine, also Sentinel Media. And you can find uh, this. We have the links up there right now. But a new Ten Commandments. They probably will be in a classroom near you. Not the original good ones from God. But the new Ten Commandments that talk about nature being a divinity or the earth being a divinity. Um, that essentially advocate everything that is not of God. I found it interesting, too, that he got 40 minutes. And I know I didn't want to kind of spoil his article. 40 minutes with these guys and kind of what their thoughts were in co-opting the faith community to come alongside the one world religion, government, economy agenda. And that they think they can do it through shared virtues. Now, Again, you know, one of the discernment points here is is the connections and what organizations people are connected to. Um, Council on Foreign Relations, uh, Rick Warren, for example, on that. And, you know, you don't, this doesn't necessarily mean they're bad people, but the connections should start raising some questions. And our discernment level should be up, especially if there's people connected to these organizations that are now advocating one world religion and a new Ten Commandments. Again, this Sunday, 10 o'clock, uh, this is going to be awesome, and I really appreciate Flame of Fire Ministries and Andre Shop of all being here. May God bless all of you, and he is making this generation the greatest one. Keep up the fight.